I want to ask you a question to get started. Well, I'll get into the question in just a second. But, you know, as every kid is unique as they grow up, and I have two young kids right now, you know, there are some different categories kids fall into, especially as they get older. Either the one who breaks the rules, pushes the boundaries, or the ones who follow the rules. So let me ask by a show of hands, how many of you tend to get in trouble as a kid? Maybe you still get in trouble as an adult. Um, wow, we got some either not truthful people or not a lot of troublemakers in the room this morning. How many of you are more agreeable, kind of follow the rules kind of people here this morning? All right. Man, we got to wake you guys up. You guys are like, I'm sort of here, Pastor. I'm kind of in the room. That's all that matters, right? You're in the room. All right, that's a good start. Um, well, you know, I was thinking about my youth, and I wasn't um, little when this happened, um, but you know what? As I grew up, I was overall a rule follower, and I still am, but I'm the, like, push-the-boundaries kind of rule follower. Like, I try not to step over the line, but I try to get as close to that line as I can safely get to, as I feel like I can do. And, you know, as I was younger, as I got older, right after I got my first job at 16, um, I was driving my dad's truck, and I was work. It was a long day at work. And as I was, I got in the truck to leave the parking lot, and I, you know, was just not in a good mood. And so I was not really paying attention. And I drove that truck right up onto a rock in the middle of the parking lot. And I perfectly beached that truck on the rock right in the middle. I couldn't go forward. I couldn't go backwards. I was perfectly balanced on that rock. And I was, I was a scared 16-year-old kid as I called my dad for help because um, there was nothing else I could do. And um, my dad came, and he wasn't exactly excited about the situation. Um, and I was there, and we needed a second truck to remedy the situation. So he called my uncle, and he just sent me home. He's like, I don't even, well, I don't even want you here right now. <laughs> you can just go. And I went home, and you know what I did for the next couple weeks, next couple months, right? I was as good as I could be. Like, I was early for family dinner. I was as kind as I could be to my parents. Like, I was just like, I knew that I messed up, and I was doing what I could to remedy that situation, you know? And whether it's true of kids and for grown-ups, right? We have a sense that we need to balance things out, right, as we make a mistake even in life. And today we're going to wrap up last series, last sermon on our Explore God series before we head into something else. And I'm going to wrap it up with the question, how can I have a personal relationship with Jesus? How can you have a personal relationship with Jesus? I'm going to go further than that. If you, you know, if you're still exploring faith, welcome, and that's part of the question I want to ask today. If you're already a follower of Jesus, I want to go a little bit deeper as we head into our message today. I want to encourage you and challenge you in your faith journey to experience God in a new way, even, in a deeper way as we get there. But as we think about, like, weight and balances, the Bible does say this. It says, for by works of the law, no human will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Right? No, um, no person, no man, no woman will be justified by the works of the law, but we often see it a little bit differently. It's like applying Newton's law in ways it was never intended to be applied. Right? The law says for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Right? If, if I have an action over here, like something happens to this. And most of us ask, you know, when, especially when we make a mistake in one of our relationships, we ask, like, how can I balance this out? We, don't, we often don't even realize we're doing this. And I think most of us, it's just a pattern or a familiar habit thinking about responding in relationships, right? If you get frustrated and lose your cool with one of your kids, right, you're like, uh-oh, like, what can I do? How can I, like, take my kid out for ice cream so that I can balance this out, right? And fix the problem of, that I just had, right? There's a balance now, or at least a balance in the right direction in my parenting relationship, right? It could be, you know, that when we're in different situations, right, we try to balance things out. And, you know, as we go through this in life, right, it could be at work, we, we make a mistake and we're like trying to make it up to our boss. It could be in one of our situations um, and we just say, you know what, like, I, you know, I, I let one of my friends down. I showed up late 
and I canceled on them maybe at the last minute, and all of a sudden, you know, this scale is not balanced the way it's supposed to be in our relationship. Next time you hang out with that friend, you're like, how can I do everything I possibly can to compliment them and just really encourage them and just be a kind friend so that I can like start to regain some balance in my friendship, in my relationship once again. And with God, we tend to do the same thing, whether we realize it or not. We think, you know, how can I do more good in my relationship as, than possible? How can I relate to God in a positive way more than I do in a negative way? How do I do more good things than sin and bad things in my life? But there's some problems with this principle. First off, we find ourselves striving for perfection of like we want to get as much as possible on the good side of the scale. And we try to really hard to keep everything possible off the bad side of the scale, maybe, you know, and when we do mess up, we quickly try to balance things out. As soon as we put a couple bad things over here, and this is, you know, out of balance, we try to get everything as possible on the good side. You know, we try to go, you know, help out at church, or we try to, you know, maybe volunteer at our kid's school, or make a, maybe we try to get through the whole day without making that mistake that we're trying to, like, eliminate from our life. We try to make it up to those people around us. So the first thing we try to do is we try to strive for perfection, both in life, but we try to do that with God as well. Secondly, sometimes we find ourselves trying to be just good enough. Like, you know what, if this was balanced off in the bad over here, we try to get, you know, oh, I, I just made it to the good. Like, we're just, we're a little bit over there. I got just enough on the good side of the scale. When we make a mistake and we remind ourselves, um, and we just try to pretend like, okay, you know what, we got just enough good over there. And we might make fun of even the spiritual perfectionists around of us. We're like, there's no way you're actually perfect, right? My goal is just to be good enough in life. Like, that's the realistic reality. Like, if I can just be good enough, that's what I can do. And, and lastly, we give up and we give in and we just don't even care. Some of us are like, you know what? I don't, like, my scale is already tipped to the bad. I might as well just add. How many things can I add over here? Like, it doesn't matter. It's already unbalanced. Who cares if there's some more things over there? We just give in. We might as well give up because we're not going to make it perfect anyway. And ultimately, these options, striving for perfection, aiming to be just good enough, simply giving up, leave us in exactly the same place, right? But we're, we're striving for that. We have this idea of how do we get this to balance? Correct? Like, we try so hard. Matter of fact, when I, I purchased two weeks ago a scale— so that I could make the sermon illustration. Because I was out of town all week, and I knew that I wasn't going to be able to come back in time. I was like, I'm going to plan ahead. So I bought a scale, and la two nights ago, I opened up the box to get it ready for my illustration here. And that scale is not this scale. That scale was welded flat like this, <laughs> perfectly in balance. Didn't actually work. It was just a decoration that we put in our houses here because we all want to be perfectly in balance. And so it, it didn't actually, it said balance scale, and it had the, you know, little things on both sides, but perfectly stuck in balance. You couldn't move it if you wanted to, right? We have this idea of like, let's try to be just like that. So I had to whip this up, and then I'm like, I have this, I'm like, how do I get it to balance correctly? I like was moving things around, like, okay, this is good enough, right? I was in that, well, it's good enough. I got a little bit more on the one side than the other. It's good enough. We, we try in our relationship with God, many of us, maybe all of us, to just balance things out, like we, that seeps into our relationship with him. The reality, while skills are a part, and the idea of good and bad is a part of faith, it's not how we're meant to relate to God. And it can be exhausting to relate to him in that way, because it's not the reality of how God wants to relate to us. And the reality is we're going to fail every time. The Bible tells us this. We are all not perfect. We're going to fail every time. The reality of God and part of the challenge of this is it seems too good to be true. It's too good for us to accept the reality of what it's actually like in relationship to God. See, the scales make sense with us, to us. It's how we operate with others in our lives. A God that would pursue us, a God that would love us when we turn our back on him, that doesn't make any sense. A God that we've continually come to and then messed up our relationship with, God that would then continue to show his love to us, even though we keep screwing it up, 
that doesn't make sense to us. Because nobody is like that. We might have some people that are sort of like that, that can be like that sometimes, that are kind of good and loving towards us. But everybody has a limit. And so a God that doesn't have a limit, that will continue to pursue us, right? There's consequences to our mistakes, but a God that will continue to pursue us with love, that's just too good to be true. That doesn't make sense to us. But it's true, and when we accept it, it frees us from the reality of the scales and brings us into a relationship, a true relationship with God and who he is. And we replace the false God that we control by trying to do more good than bad with the true God of the universe. And let me tell you the truth about the scales, because there is some biblical truth about the scales, right? It's just not the truth that the goal is to load up more good than bad. That's not the goal of life. That's not the goal of our relationship with God. Everyone has loaded up that bad side with so much stuff, with so much sin in our lives. There is no possible way to get it the way it's supposed to be. Because God says, unless there is nothing on that side and only things on this side, we cannot be in relationship with him. So there's no way to, our, to fix things. Romans says it this way, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. With our selfish choices, with the things that we do in life, we have loaded up the bad side of the scale and nothing, no good deed, no amount of good in our life is enough to tip the scale back. As it is written, it says, none is righteous, no, not one. And he writes, he continues in Romans 3 to say, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. There is nothing we can do to balance things out. Nothing we can do to tip the scales in our favor. If you're worried that's bad news, some of you have heard me preach this part of this before, right? It doesn't stop there. Coming to grips with this reality actually is the point where the good news of Jesus comes in and, and changes things for us. When Jesus came in to the world as our Savior, he didn't merely take a few bad things off the scale and just kind of help us out a little bit by removing a few things over here. What he did was completely knock the scales over and take that away as the way that we relate to God. When he took the punishment of our sin on himself, he removed that and said, that doesn't matter anymore. It's been, the price for all the sin has been paid. The ability to relate to God is now in place. And so it says, he says this, for our sake, he made God, the Father, Jesus, he made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him might, we might become the righteousness of God. What we couldn't do for ourselves, Jesus did for us at the expense of his own life because that's what the payment was for our sin, for all of us. And he dealt with everything we've done by destroying our sin. And he credits his own goodness to us, his own righteousness to us instead. And this means we can stop striving for perfection as the way to be able to relate to God. God still calls us to pursue righteousness, calls us to pursue good in our life, but it, our relationship with God is not dependent on whether we succeed or not. Our relationship with God is not dependent on whether we succeed in being good in our lives, not whether we succeed in being perfect in our lives, because the reality is it's a pursuit that's bound to fail. None of us can be perfect, the Bible says. We're still supposed to pursue it, but our relationship with God is not dependent on it. And the truth is, the truth that's too good to be true is that we are loved, we are forgiven, we are welcomed, we are accepted, we are set free from our sin and our past by Jesus. When we put our trust, when we put our faith in him, what he has done for us on the cross is more than enough. God credits to us the righteousness, the goodness of Jesus to our accounts. We could have a spiritual debt of a million dollars, two million dollars. It doesn't matter what the spiritual debt is. We are credited the goodness, the righteousness of Jesus, and the sin, the bad in our lives is taken away. God doesn't care about it. He doesn't look at it. Our relationship is changed. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so many of us make 
the assumption that God evaluates our relationship with him just like we evaluate relationships in our life. We think that God has his own version of balancing the scales or evaluating the scales, but it's not true. God is not like us. He has freely extended his grace through Jesus. And when we come to know the heart of God revealed to us in Jesus, we discover that balancing the scales has never been what God is after. He's not after that. What God wants is a relationship with you. He wants your heart. He wants to be in that relationship. Ephesians says this, May you have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This is Paul's prayer for one of the churches that he helped start, that they might know and comprehend the love of God. What I want to encourage you this morning, wherever your relationship with God is at, wherever your faith journey is at, my prayer for you is that you would better comprehend the love of God in your life. And the crazy thing about the love of God, of what Paul is saying here, is that we need the strength of God, we need strength to actually comprehend his love, because it's a love like no other love around us. It's a love that takes effort, it takes strength to actually understand what that love is like for us. I was telling a story to a new couple to our church a couple weeks ago, and it reminded me of God's love for us. Because sometimes God's love can be really evident to us. Sometimes it can be easy to see, and sometimes we feel like, God, where are you? Sometimes we feel like, God, I don't know about the love of God. I, I'm a little concerned about God right now and what he's doing in my life and around me. But I was telling a story about uh, one of the very first times I preached a sermon, and um, I was in the mountains in northern India preaching this sermon, or going to preach it. And in the morning, I just felt like God told me the message I had been working on for weeks was not the message to preach. I was supposed to preach on something different. I was supposed to change my message to be about God's love for us and how much he cares for us. And my message was supposed to be on that our responsibility is to go to him when times are difficult. Actually, funny enough, part of what our vision for this church was, that at Tekoa, when times were difficult, the people of Israel went to God and he provided for them. And my message to this church that I was going to preach was about going to God in difficult times and that he would share his love and he would provide for them. And I prepped this message, and I went, and I preached it, and it wasn't that great because it was one of the first messages I ever preached as a preacher. And I preached it through a translator, and he kept asking me throughout it. He said, did you know what happened here? And I kept being like, no, what, what, what are you talking about? And in the Jeep ride on the way home, the translator was like, you didn't know what happened. And I was like, no, I didn't know what happened. And he's like, that church just lost, that church of like a couple dozen people just lost one of their elders, he died earlier this week. And the people kept asking me, like, did you know what happened? I said, no, I didn't know what happened. I just felt like that's the message that the Holy Spirit was telling me to share to those people. And he's like, that message to those people was exactly what they needed to hear. And the thing that stuck out to me about that as the outsider in that situation was not that I was anybody special, because I really wasn't. But what stuck out to me was God cared about that little church in that mountain place in India so much that he sent somebody from across the world to deliver a message to them about how much he loved them and cared about them and saw what they were going through and got to tell them in a way that, yes, he could tell them through somebody else in their church, but there was something about sending somebody that knew nothing about their situation to say, God saying, I love you so much, I'm sending a messenger to you to tell you, if you go to me when times are difficult, I will provide, and I love you so much, I'm going to send somebody from across the world. I see you. It doesn't matter that there's only 20 people in your little church. I love you so much, I'm going to send somebody for you. And God loves us deeply. And sometimes we get to see it, sometimes we don't get to see it. He loves deeply. And it's not just when you're going through a hard time. I hope that many of us in the room are going through great times. And even when times are good, God wants to show us more deeply his love for us. We need to understand the love of God, the fullness of that love. 
we need strength to understand it, that he would love us so much, right, that he would send his only son, Jesus, for us. It surprises us. It passes all comprehension and understanding that he would do that when we were still sinners. Why would he do that? And so Paul prays for us to be able to, for his church, which I think is a prayer for us too, to understand the love of God, the breath of his love, right? To our right and our left, the love of God, the length of God's love, front and back of us, the height above us, the depth down below us of his love. What is that telling us? That we are in the middle of God's love. Can't go to the right or the left, front or back, up or down. We are surrounded by his love. And so much when we're in the middle of it that we can't comprehend the vastness that surrounds us of that love. That there is nowhere we could go to escape that love. There's nowhere we could go where we would not be surrounded by that love anymore. There's nothing we could do to change that love of God for us. We are surrounded by it. We can't comprehend it enough, so Paul is praying that his church, I'm praying our church, would have the strength to comprehend better that love, because that love will change us. That love will change us. Right? Dimensions that he talks about, the height, the depth, the, the, the front and the back, they add complexity. Dimensions add complexity. If I'm driving down the road, and it's just a straight road, right, there's not too much exciting that can happen. We're going to have a drag race, or I can go slow, that's about all that can happen. Road starts getting a little twists and turns, right and left, adds a little complexity to it for us. We go through like one of those crazy interchanges like 101 and 280, right? And like we're up in the air and down and around. Like there's some complexity now to it. God's love is complex in its entirety. There is nowhere you can go. There's nowhere you can drive. There's nowhere you can fly. There's nothing you can do to escape the love of God. There's nowhere you can go where you will not be surrounded by his love. And the beautiful thing that Paul is saying here is that the more you understand and comprehend it, the more you will understand the fullness of God and who he is. Why do we want to know his fullness? Why is this Paul's prayer for his church? Why is this my prayer for our church that we would understand the love of God better? Because understanding and receiving the love of God leads to the fullness of God, and the fullness of God leads to the power of God in his spirit. That's what he's saying. That the more we can comprehend his love for us, the more we'll actually get to experience him. And the more we experience him, the more we'll get to live in the power of God, the strength of God in our lives. So if you want more of God's power, more of God's strength in your life, pray and open yourself to receive more of his love for your life. Because the love is what leads to the power of God in your life. The fullness, it's the knowledge and the relationship with God, the power in the Holy Spirit. And Paul is praying, would you understand the fullness of his love? Would you understand that there's nothing you can do to escape it? Would you understand that when you're receiving it, his love is so vast, so complex, it is fully surrounding you? Would you understand it? Because when you understand it, you will get to experience the fullness of God, and that fullness will lead to his power in your life. If you're looking for more of God in your life, receive more of his love. That is the way to receive more of it in your life. There is nowhere you could go. So I want to challenge you, church, to pray for that. We're going to pray for that in a few minutes at the end of our message, but pray to God. What do you need to understand more? If you're lacking understanding, even as we've been exploring God, pray that you would understand his love more. Pray that you would understand him more. Because that is what leads to the power of God in your life, more understanding. So how could you experience more of God's love in your life this week? How can you do that? Understanding and receiving the love of God leads to the fullness of God, and the fullness of God leads to the power of God in our life. God's dream has always been to have an authentic and close relationship with us, with humanity, the people of God. All the way back, I mean before this even, but back to the prophet Jeremiah, he said, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, right, our law, and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor 
and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. What he wants, what he's going to write is that on our hearts is the love of God, the truth in Jesus, that we are set free from that, that we have a relationship with him. God wants every person to know him. Knowing, true biblical knowing is actually experiencing. You can know an idea in your head, but to really know what the Grand Canyon is like, you can't just hear about it. You can't just see a picture of it. Until you go to that place and experience it, you can't fully understand it. You can't know what Niagara Falls is like. You can't know what a good cheeseburger is like until you experience one. Right? You have to experience it to fully understand it. And the way that a parent knows their child's joys, dreams, fears, and personality, the way two best friends can know each other, their heart and their love and their, their humor and outlook on life, the way that a husband and wife know each other is through experiencing life together. To know someone is about experiencing and attaching yourself to that person and going through life. It involves a commitment, a dedication, a purpose to one another. And God's dream has always been to know us each personally. And now because of Jesus, each of us has the opportunity to know God in this personal way that we could never before because our sin got in the way of it. But through Jesus, we have the opportunity for that relationship. And so we're to quit striving to balance the scales or to tip them in our favor. Our job, our response to God is to put our trust in Jesus, to receive what he has done for us in our lives, something that we would never be able to do in our, on our own. We'd never be able to tip the scales in our favor. Instead, they've been taken care of for us through the work of Jesus. The weight of all of our striving, the weight of all of our trying to put things right has been lifted when you receive the gift of Jesus. You are loved, you are accepted, you are forgiven, you are welcomed in to the kingdom of God, you are welcomed into his home, to his family, you are accepted, and you are set free from all of your sin and everything that has been in your past and in your life. A relationship with Jesus is not just about striving harder, it's not just about trying more, it's about trusting Jesus and knowing and following the one who gave it all to bring us back in relationship with the Father in heaven. I'm going to invite um, Neil back up here as we finish up. But I want to invite you, if you are not a follower of Jesus, to trust in the good news of him and what he has done. See, the reality is that we are surrounded by God's love. He loved us so much, but there was a problem our sin entered in. We broke relationship with him and there was no way for us to restore that relationship because God could not be relationship with those who had sin. So God loved us, but the problem was our sin was in the way. God had provided a solution though. He sent Jesus for us. He sent Jesus who came and had no sin, who died on the cross for us. And Jesus paid it all for us. And he said, whoever puts their faith in me and the work that I have done and trust God will be in relationship with God forever. So where that leaves us is our response to him. Do we respond to him? Do we say, Jesus, I confess my sin, I confess my mistakes, and I put my trust in you. I accept your gift, and I choose to follow you. That's the opportunity that's set before us. So I want to invite us to bow our heads for a minute, close our eyes, and spend a minute in prayer. I want to invite you to listen for a minute. Is God reaching out to you? Is he speaking to you? Is he trying to, is he sharing with you, I love you so much?
I want to invite you right now, if you've never put your faith in Jesus, if you feel like God is sharing with you right now, I want to be in relationship with you. I love you so much. But you've never taken that step to respond, to accept it, to do that right now. When you do that, just, just pray along with me. Jesus, I believe I've messed up. Jesus, I believe you lived a perfect life. You died for me, and you rose again. And Jesus, I choose to follow you. Amen. As we continue praying, actually, I want to give one more invitation to us this morning. Now, you've been following Jesus for a long time. Maybe your journey's been up and down, and wherever you're at right now in that journey, I want to invite you to experience the love of God in a new way this morning. I don't know how God might want to do that with you, but if you want to understand His love as I preach so that you can understand His fullness so that you can experience the power of God in your life, I want to invite you, as everybody's heads bowed and their eyes are closed right now, if you're here this morning and you want to experience the power of God, the love of God in your life, say, I just, I want to know Him more. I want more of it. I'm in that boat. If you just raise your hand this morning, just a way to, to signal outwardly, hey, God, I want more of you in my life. I want your love. I want to know it. Maybe you've never felt the love of God before. Maybe you've never experienced it. Just to say to God, I want to experience your love. I want to know your love, God. So that's my prayer this morning, God. Would you reveal yourself to our church? Lord, whether somebody's hand's raised or not, would you just share your love with them? Would, would, would you give them the strength to better comprehend and better understand your love? Just as Paul prayed for his church, I'm praying for our church. God, that we would understand your love, God, because we want to know you more. May you do that this morning, Lord. Amen. God longs for every person to know him personally to encounter, to experience life, to share with him, to share with him the good and the bad of life. And through faith in Jesus, we are loved, we are forgiven, we are welcomed in, we are set free from our past. I want to invite you to respond this morning. And as we finish up here this morning, you can respond through um, a couple of ways I want to invite you to respond this morning. One of those is, as, as we um, respond in singing, why don't we all stand up here? We're going to respond in worship. You can respond that way. There's also in the back table back there, we have this available each week. If you are a follower of Jesus, there's communion available back there, and you can take that on your own at any point during our worship here in our response. It's an opportunity if we follow Jesus to just come to him and remember that his body was broken for us, his blood was shed for us, and we're reminded of our salvation in him. You could have been a Christian your whole life, you could have just decided to follow him today, and that is available to you, and God will meet you as you come to him in communion. Another way we can respond is through our giving. I want to invite you to do that as we respond in worship. You can give online or at the box in the back there. It's just a way to respond to God, to say, yeah, I recognize all that I have comes from you. I'm grateful to you for what you have given to me, God, and I'm returning to you some of what has been given and entrusted and stewarded to me. You can do that online or at the box by the back. And then I want to invite you during this time to just invite God to share his love with you, to experience him more. Whether you raised your hand before or not, to just come to him and say, God, I want to experience more of your love. God, would you show it to me? If you want prayer for that, I'll be down here in the front. I'd love to pray for you. Um, but let's respond in worship, that, that we would respond to him this morning, what he has done to us. Let's praise him together.